Our next presenter this afternoon is the 2021 John Oxley Library Fellow, Dr. Henry Rees. Henry is a historian and professional researcher and the 2021 John Oxley Fellow at the State Library of Queensland. His research focuses on sound and other energies in settler colonial society in the 19th and 20th centuries. His 2019 PhD thesis, Colonial Soundscapes, was the first cultural history of early sound recording in Australia. Henry is in the final stages of preparing this work for publication as a book, and if I can have my way for broadcast on ABC Radio Brisbane and Queensland. His 2021 John Oxley Fellowship is entitled Electrifying Queensland, Modern Machines in the Sunshine State. And it explores the cultural history of electricity and technology in Queensland in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Henry is also the 2022 Harry Gentle Visiting Fellow at Griffith University. Henry works as a research assistant on several projects, including an Australia Research Council linkage project called Merchants and Museums, which brings together an interdisciplinary group of historians, scientists, and museum professionals to retrace the global trade in natural history museum specimens in the 19th century. Fascinating. Henry has taught history at universities for the last eight years and he is currently working as a sessional lecturer at the Australian Catholic University. Please welcome Henry to the stage. Thanks so much, Kat. And thank you to Rob and Mark for such fascinating presentations. I've just lost my text here. <laughs> Found it here. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Fantastic. So, as I get started, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting here on Yagara and Turrbal lands here in Mianjin. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd also like to extend my acknowledgement and respect to all First Nations people here today. So it's a real honour to be able to present to you just a little fragment of my research today. This project has been, it's been such a privilege and it's been come at a really important time, I think, in my life as a researcher. I found my time as a researcher here at the State Library to be a transformative, stimulating and affirming experience, and I'm ever so grateful to everyone here for making me feel so welcome over the last 18 months or so. This was the first time that I'd received funding for a new research project since finishing my PhD back in late 2019, um, and I can't say how important it's been to be able to have the encouragement and the space to explore, to take risks and to strike out into a new research direction like this. It's been absolutely fantastic. It's also really wonderful and a little bit daunting to be talking about my research in front of so many dear friends, uh, colleagues and mentors today as well, especially for my friends. This is the first time you will have heard me talk about my research. Um, I hope we're still friends by the end of this, but you've seen me in full nerd mode by now. Um, but I am really blown away by the support and I'm ever so grateful to you all for coming out today to, to listen to me. So let's get started then, shall we? Today. I would like to report to you on some of the materials that I've explored here at the State Library and to present some of the provisional findings from my fellowship project, which I've called Electrifying Queensland, Modern Machines in the Sunshine State. So for my John Oxley Fellowship project, I wanted to explore the cultural history of electricity in Queensland. So the history of electricity is, is interesting, I think, because it's a topic that's been both over-researched and under-researched at the same time. So there's been a lot of excellent work on technical aspects of the electricity supply industry and on energy policy. There's been some amazing work there. And we have some really detailed local studies of very particular areas. Um, we also have some really great studies of particular contexts like, say, domestic electricity usage uh, and, and the way that kind of domestic lives are changed through access to electrical appliances, things like that. But often a lot of these very different aspects are kind of explored in isolation from each other. And they often focus on the production of electricity largely rather than its consumption or use. So I wanted to try to fit all these contexts together and see what kind of picture emerges when we do that. So I want to use encounters with and conversations about electricity and technology as a way of exploring how Queenslanders have related to their world. What has electricity meant in Queensland? How has this changed over time and why does this matter? Um, so as Kat said in her very generous introduction, I began my research career thinking about sound, the history of sound. I was interested in sort of putting gramophones and phonographs 
kind of machines of sound recording and sound reproduction in the Australian landscape and seeing what kind of cultural responses they provoked. Um, I kind of wanted to do a similar thing or expand the horizon slightly from that kind of project with this fellowship. Um, I found that sound recording provoked a wide range of different kind of cultural associations when this technology was brand new in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. This was a time of rapid technological change. So when settler colonists in Australia thought about sound recording, they also thought about a range of other things. They thought about communications technologies like the telegraph and the telephone. They thought about technologies of global transport like railways and steamships. They thought about the past and they thought about the future. And by positioning themselves in relation to this assemblage of new things and ideas, they understood themselves to be modern, to be up to date, and to be participating in the global project of the British Empire of industrial modernity and of global capitalism. There's a really big picture that's kind of connected here, I think. Now, I found as well, excitingly, that a lot of the time, settlers were also thinking about electricity in a similar way. Electricity was rapidly changing their experience of the world at the same time. So that's what I want to do. I want to give electricity, I want to kind of follow it around and find different contexts where it proved meaningful uh, in Queensland uh, in the years before the Second World War. So I've chosen to explore electricity in the couple of generations before the Second World War when the technology was still fairly new and open to a range of different meanings. These years saw the spread of, the electrical, tele of, sorry, the spread of electrical telegraph wires across the country in the late 19th century. They saw spectacular demonstrations in public of new electrical technologies. They saw the foundation and the expansion of the first electrical grid systems that supplied streetlights and transportation from the 1890s. Uh, they saw the rise of a commercial trade in electrical supplies and appliances. They saw the arrival of new electrical media like the talkies and radio in the 1920s. And especially by the 1920s and 30s, this period saw the spread of electrical wiring and domestic appliances into the home. Um, so I wanted to look at each of these contexts and put the pieces together. And as you can see, I set myself perhaps an impossibly large task. And like Mark, I'm going to be working on this for a very long time. Um, I framed this project as almost a pilot project, as a way of kind of exploring this context with a view to hopefully really expanding and spending a lot more time there. So if anyone has any suggestions of future areas I can explore as well, please don't hesitate to uh, lay them on me. So let's think about the big picture just for a second here. I think exploring this history matters for several reasons. The story of electricity in Queensland obviously was and still is a story of fossil fuel dependency. In the time period in question, electricity was generated in Queensland by burning large amounts of coal, mostly obtained from local sources such as the Ipswich coal fields. The electricity company that su supplied central Brisbane burned 15 tonnes of coal a day in 1899. By 1917, this had risen to 1,000 tonnes a month and kept on rising. So electricity became an important part of economic life, of industry, culture, and imagination in Queensland at precisely the same time that world consumption of fossil fuels kicked into high gear. So indeed, these two developments were actually intertwined. By the 1890s, at the same time that the very first power stations were getting up and running in Queensland, coal overtook biomass for the first time ever to become the world's primary fuel source. It would remain in first place until it was overtaken by oil around 1965. So I think then understanding the history of electricity has very important implications for the emerging field of energy history. Um, a lot of historians in very different ways are starting to explore histories of energy in a cultural sense. And this can help us understand the ways that societies came to support or validate certain energy regimes. An important new seam of research is starting to explore the connections between energy usage and colonialism in particular. So as the historian Nathan Kapoor has recently argued, the establishment of fossil fuel and electrical power regimes in the 19th century coincides with the largest global imperial and colonial acquisitions in history. The transition to these new systems of power production and political organization is not coincidental. The utilization of these resources played a role in fabricating imperial and colonial expansion in the 19th century, thus embedding practices of resource manipulation, environmental neglect, and labor exploitation into the foundations of those energy infrastructures, many of which persist to this day. So that's the really big picture. I think that understanding the history of energy in a settler colonial context in Queensland is important because it can help us see how ideology attached to energy sources as well. So in the late 19th century and the early 20th centuries, for many, um, for many colonial societies around the world, including in Queensland, electricity came to indicate progress. Electrical power, communications and lighting served as markers of modernity and also provided a staging ground for colonial desires to master their environments, including by transforming the environment through massive infrastructure projects. So what I want to suggest then today, it's full of um, all sorts of 
anomalous appearances of different technologies in the Queensland landscape, like this amazing picture that I can't stop thinking about. Um, what, what I, there are many more like that as well. What I want to suggest today is that discussions around electricity provided one of the major ways that Queenslanders understood daily life in the early 20th century. And that electricity was part of the way in which Queenslanders imagined themselves to be modern. And so I want to briefly introduce you to four overlapping contexts uh, regarding some of the materials I've found in my research so far. Um, there's, I've, I've decided to keep several aspects of this upstairs in the white gloves experience because there's so much to say. There's such a vast amount of material that I can't really do it justice here. So I'll introduce you to some of these contexts that give us some insight, I think, into the very different ways that electricity was used and imagined in the years before the Second World War. Alrighty, so firstly, I want to emphasise that the meanings, uses and functions of electricity and technology in Queensland initially took shape in public through spectacular and ideologically charged performances. Let's start our story in the year 1878. This was the, the year that Thomas Edison in America and Joseph Swan in Britain first began to commercialise their new and improved light bulbs. Only a few months later, Brisbane audiences experienced these new inventions on display in public at the third exhibition of the Royal National Agricultural and Industrial Association of Queensland, better known to us today as the ECA. So at this time, William Cracknell, the Queensland Superintendent of Telegraphs, had gone to great lengths to procure over 100 electric light bulbs from Sydney, especially for the occasion. And these combined to create what the Brisbane Courier called an electric light of great power. Local electricians conducted demonstrations of machinery, including mining and agricultural equipment, an early microphone, and something described as an electric thief detector. <laughs> the Ecker also boasted what was called a fairy fountain that lit up in a variety of colourful lights, torpedoes were exploded using electrical charges, and the outdoor prize ceremonies were illuminated by bright arc lights. This electrified exhibition was an overwhelming and dramatic multi-sensory experience, I think, charged with meaning for colonial audiences. It encourages us, I think, to see that Queensland was not a late adopter here. It was woven into the global story of electricity from the very beginning. Um, Queensland has also initially encountered electricity as a dramatic anomaly, as a rupture in everyday life that happened through performances. And this encouraged them to reflect on their place in the world and look to the future. So displays of new technologies were a really stable, if kind of ambiguous, genre of public performance throughout the late 19th century. There were regular organised performances at exhibitions and industrial and agricultural shows across the country. Governments and businesses put on public exhibits of light bulbs and other, other kinds of street lighting or sign lighting. Uh, and this kind of encouraged audiences to explicitly think about electricity and technology. And one way in which that really happened, in, in, in a way that I've been fascinated to explore, it's one of the things I've been most interested in looking at, which I started looking at during my PhD research, is through the genre of the scientific lecture by a touring scientific expert. Thousands of these kinds of performances took place throughout late colonial Queensland and Australia more broadly. A whole community of self-described scientific lecturers toured the country conducting demonstrations of new technologies like the telephone or the gramophone, the x-ray from about 1896 and the cinema. They attracted consistently large audiences that drew breathless reports and press reviews. And so historians have seen this kind of performance as belonging to this hybrid unstable genre that some historians have called the wonder show, in which technologies of showmanship, kind of public, um, a public presentation, combine with popular science education. Here, science and technology are used to create surprise and then pleasure, where the spectator's day-to-day -day perceptions are shattered and they're open to new realms of possibility. It's an explicit context where audiences are encouraged to think about what their world is, how it works, what their future might be. And so I was excited to realise as well to learn that the pioneers of the electrical industry in Brisbane were also active participants in this larger-than-life world of popular performance. So it would be impossible to tell this story without mentioning the role of the electrician and businessman Edward Gustavus Campbell Barton, popularly remembered as one of the founding fathers of the electrical industry in this city. So Barton was born in Melbourne, educated in Germany. He was part of this global network of, of, of globally mobile adopters and entrepreneurs that pioneered electrical grid systems throughout the late 19th century. As a contractor for the engineering company Siemens, he was involved in setting up the world's first public electricity supply in the English town of Godalming in 1881. He moved to Australia in the 1880s, and by 1888, in partnership with the Brisbane salesman Cedric White, he set up the firm of Barton, White & Company and opened a workshop and, power and powerhouse in Telegraph Lane, later renamed Edison Lane, uh, just south of the G... Oh, sorry, just down the street. I think it's north, actually, of the GPO in the city. Barton and his company became some of the key players in municipal electrical supply, especially after the colonial governments provided a regulatory framework for the emerging electricity industry in 1896. 
In addition, Barton worked as a consultant on electrification projects for factories, mines, plantations, and councils across Queensland. So, as you, you can see upstairs, if you'd like, at the White Gloves uh, presentation, at the White Gloves experience, the John Oxley Library holds a really unique collection of the records of Edward Barton and his businesses. And these provide us with a pretty extraordinary glimpse into the unstable early history of the electrical industry. But what I was especially surprised to discover was that Barton, as well as being a kind of electrical entrepreneur, he also trafficked in the world of popular entertainment. In particular, he came to prominence as an early exhibitor of the phonograph, the sound recording machine invented by Thomas Edison in the late 1870s, and that became a global phenomenon by the early 1890s. This isn't him, but this is an example of sort of how phonograph demonstrators as part of this genre of wonder show kind of presented themselves. Now, the phonograph at this time wasn't electrical, but it provoked dramatic reflections on science, technology, and modernity from its audiences. And phonograph demonstrations were one of the most popular kinds of wonder shows at this time. So I think exploring Edward Barton as not just a businessman, but also a kind of popular lecturer, he gave nearly 200 performances with his phonograph, his sound recording machine, between 1891 and 1893, offers us a really interesting or kind of slightly different perspective, perhaps, on the foundations of public electricity supply. Um, we see him as a popularizer at the same time as he was a, a, a commercial figure. And so I think this, thinking about, him, thinking about this early, early period like this helps us kind of collapse boundaries between categories like commerce, science, and popular culture, and to recognize that new technologies didn't emerge outside of culture. They kind of emerged in, dist in distinctive local contexts and took on new meanings through performance, through being worked out in public. I think this... Another example that illustrates the kind of plasticity and openness of this period is, this, fa is um, this famous example of when a hydroelectric plant using water from an artesian bore opened in Thargaminda in the west of the state in 1898, uh, one of the kind of earliest examples of hydropower in the country. This local renewable co um, community energy source helps add some contingency, I think, to this story as well, um, emphasising the, the kind of openness of this early period, and it also, I think, destabilizes predetermined narratives of electricity supply being necessarily shaped around kind of large-scale coal power. So an interesting time of possibility and openness, I think, in this early period. The second context I want to explore, I want, to, I want you to join a sort of strange obsession that I've developed over the last few months. I want to explore the way that electrical infrastructure transformed the Queensland landscape and on a really large scale. I want us to think of Queensland here as an energy landscape, and it's something that I think becomes especially clear when we look at the visual record. So I was struck with a realization early on in my research. To look at photos of Queensland in the late 19th century, especially in towns and cities, is to be struck by the omnipresence of electrical infrastructure. Telegraph wires, electrical trams, power lines, and electrical light poles, uh, as well as gas lighting poles that had been established for several decades prior. The landscape itself bore testament to the technology and the energy that was shaping it. And once you notice this, I feel like it's impossible to not look at any photo from, um, <laughs> from the State Library collection without being struck by the sheer amount of wires that we see everywhere throughout the landscape. <laughs> once we notice how dominant wires are in the landscape, you can't unsee this. It's perhaps quite a mundane observation, but I want to take that to the forefront and think a little bit more systematically about it as well. So most of these wires that we see here were telegraph wires. From the 1860s onwards, after Queensland separated from New South Wales, the colonial government supported a vast infrastructure project that slung a latticework of telegraph wires across the state. And this was a huge undertaking. By 1900, Queensland boasted 422 separate te public telegraph stations, linked by 18,565 miles of wire. This required large quantities of timber to support it as well. This is a, a large-scale infrastructure project. By 1872 then, with the completion of the Overland Telegraph Line, the Australian colonies were plugged into a global network of information. And as colonists at the time often boasted, the telegraph helped, in their minds, conquer distance. And this project was especially important for the spread of settler colonialism in such a vast and decentralised territory as Queensland. So I think other wires soon crossed the country as well. When electric lighting and power lines were erected um, in most regional areas in, in the 20th century, they served as an occasion for kind of intensely local civic ceremony as communities across the state gathered to observe the first switching on of the lights. Here's an example from Mackay in the early 1920s. It's worth emphasising that this happened in different, at different times in different places across the state. In the years before the Second World War, there was no central coordination of electrical projects. A whole range of different municipal and shire councils emerged to bring electric lighting and power to different areas at different times. Electricity spread in a public sense in a very patchy and haphazard way over the space of generations. 
And so I think the intersection of the colonial landscape with electrical technology is something that the Queensland government also explicitly highlighted in booster literature aimed at promoting Queensland to overseas investors and prospective migrants. So this, for example, is from a, um, a tourist booklet, some sort of booster literature produced for the San Francisco International Exposition in 1915. And as has been my obsession recently, I can't help but look at this picture and think of the very deliberate placing of a telegraph pole in the very center of it. It sort of highlights, it says something very particular about how the state understands itself and understands its kind of connection to technology. In the early 20th century, there were other in infrastructural transformations as well, as electrical lighting came to supplant the gas lights that had spread in urban areas from the 1860s. This also was a cause for reflection on the smaller transformations that had shaped everyday life in previous generations. The environmental transformations of electrical infrastructure, I think, are quite considerable and deserve more attention. And so I think here as well, in this network of straight lines across the territory, we do also see an attempted imposition of a particular settler colonial way of ordering space onto Aboriginal land. Another thing worth bearing in mind here too is that a lot of labour went into the wires. This was a very largely coordinated activity um, in both urban and rural areas. And so I think men, my, my brief review here of the omnipresence of electrical wires and telegraph wires in some of the collections of the, of the John Oxley Library here make clear this kind of landscape provided the backdrop for many different lives that unfolded across Queensland to the extent that it's often seen as a normal or unremarkable part of the landscape. And I want to trouble that and think a bit more deeply about that as well. So thirdly, another important way of understanding the arrival of electricity in Queensland is by looking at the different stakeholders and interest groups which sought to structure, shape and exercise power and authority over electricity. A variety of different groups laid claim to electricity and invested it with a host of different desires and agendas. By the 1930s then, electricity became a target of government planning and oversight. Governments around Australia began to imagine electrification as an essential function of the state and as a necessary ingredient of modern administration. In late 1935 then, the Queensland government appointed a royal commission into the state's electricity industry. This royal commission had several aims, including to eliminate waste and inefficiencies and to provide some coherence to the state electricity systems. When the Royal Commission reported in 1936, its findings were sobering. It found that Queensland had fallen far behind the other Australian states in electricity supply. The average Queensland resident consumed far less electricity per capita than in all the other states. There were 62 separate autonomous electricity systems in operation across the state, run by a mix of councils and private enterprise, and with very little coordination or oversight there. Um, there was also a stark and growing divide between the southeast and the rest of the state. So 57% of the population lived in the southeast, but they used over 80% of all the energy generated in Queensland. So this report led to a major restructure of the Queensland energy system. A state electricity commission was established in 1938, and it would later divide the state into several key administrative regions for greater coordination of rural electrification. This sort of falls a little bit outside the scope of my, um, my project today, but it's an absolutely fascinating sort of story to, uh, to explore as well. The Royal Commission in 1936 made several important assumptions, I think. It opened by stating that, and I quote, the national productivity of a civilised country is to a fair degree represented by its consumption of electrical energy. So per capita energy consumption was now being used as a measure of the standard of living. Electricity was being explicitly linked to national progress and state development. And so to, to track the development of these ideas, it's been fascinating to look at the way that different, um, different officials and government figures reported on the state of electrical infrastructure in Queensland. It's been amazing to look at the papers in particular of the chair of the Royal Commission, the engineer John Robert Kemp here at the State Library. I might just skip over that for the sake of time, but um, they provide a really interesting source of material that kind of shows how engineers and state administrators were really starting to incorporate electricity as a, a kind of goal of development by the interwar period as well. I'm also fascinated by this um, quite dorky but endearing picture uh, in an official report of a trip to explore the roads of Europe and North America from 1936 of the quality of some non-skid bitumen, but we kind of see, I love the, I love the sort of, am, the, the, yeah, the sort of slightly dis disarming amateur quality of the photo. We see a bit of uh, John Kemp's shoe in the, in the background, for instance one of the many kind of fascinating and strange little discoveries you make in the archives, right? So as well, government officials weren't the only important stakeholders that participated in this rhetoric of domestic electricity consumption as an indicator of progress and modernity. By the interwar period, the various electrical supply utilities had become a more visible part of the landscape in most of the larger urban areas. Now, the rhetoric around energy usage often focused explicitly on what electricity made possible in the home, 
The imperialistic rhetoric here of the Toowoomba Electric Light and Power Company, I think, is particularly striking. It was common, I think, for electricity authorities to promote electricity in the local landscape, such as this example from Bundaberg from 1936, and a big thanks to Tamara Crew for alerting me to this photo. It would not have been hard to move through any large town in Queensland in the 1930s, or it would have been hard, sorry, to move through any town and not notice the constant emphasis on the value, importance and benefits of the energy source, albeit in very different ways in different contexts, because there was such a decentralised system with different interests and authorities involved in electrification. Another important group of stakeholders came from the commercial trade and electrical equipment, which was developing its own distinctive professional identity in these years. So we've already seen that a variety of British and American companies were involved in selling electrical equipment and devices in Queensland from the 1870s onwards. Often in the early years, multinationals such as General Electric established local branches or licensed agents to import, market and sell their equipment to local markets. In the decades after the First World War, many major electrical manufacturers moved to open local factories in Australia as well to get around high import duties. Um, local companies also sprung up to make homegrown electrical electrical equipment and appliances, such as the well-known United Metal Industries factory uh, in Wollongabba, which opened in 1925. This period also saw the rise of the electrical and radio empire of John Beale's Chandler, who later became Brisbane's Lord Mayor from 1840 to 1952. Sorry, 1940, that is. Uh, big thanks as well to Gavin Bannerman for encouraging me to look into Chandler's quite fascinating life. Uh, and there's a lot more to say here, which I don't have the time to go into today. So I think as well, changing leisure patterns in Queensland also came to depend on electricity after the First World War. With the introduction of sound film in the late 1920s, cinemas had to be rewired for sound. And in, the decade, in this decade, many more movie theatres rebranded as opulent picture palaces, offering Queensland audiences a taste of jazz age glamour, as well as being hyper-visible in the landscape. Uh, one good example here is the Birch, Carroll and Coyle Consortium, which embarked on a, an ambitious program of building a network of regional cinemas across Queensland from 1933. So likewise, too, as landscapes and as commercial environments are, are, ch are being changed, um, the dramatic rise of radio broadcasting in the same period added another important medium. So how do we take stock of such an enormous, diverse and dramatic range of different ventures in electricity at this time, ranging from factory owners, local utility companies, radio stations, engineers and retailers? One of the most exciting experiences of my fellowship was the opportunity to take a deep dive into the trade literature um, created by the electrical industry in the 1920s and 30s. Here I'm talking about the magazines created by and for people with a commercial stake in the sale of electrical machinery and appliances here. Now there were several different magazines that addressed the electrical trade in Australia from the 1920s. And the State Library of Queensland holds the most complete collection in Australia of some of the major ones. It's a really underutilised resource, I think. Trade literature is an absolutely fascinating source of material. Of particular interest to me was the Queensland Electrical and Radio World, which was a Queensland-based monthly trade paper that was first published in 1936. It, sent, it expressed a sense of common purpose to those participants in the electricity industry, as well as fostering a tone of pride in the achievements of various aspects of the industry. So again, a lot of this literature is available upstairs to have a look at during the White Gloves experience. If we open the Queensland Electrical and Radio Trader, what might we find then? I encourage you to do the same later on and have a bit of a flick through. I've read literally hundreds of um, issues of this, and so I've got sort of research indigestion. It's hard to, hard to pick the choicest examples. But we see updates on the comings and goings of various professional societies and groups. We find articles expressing a common sense of historical consciousness in the trade, especially by 18, 1938, sorry, when the electrical trade celebrated 50 years since Edward Barton's first powerhouse opened um, in Edison Lane. Already it was articulating a distinctive Queensland heritage for itself. It also contained tips on sales and design techniques, keeping retailers up to date on the latest products, trends and selling techniques. It featured regular biographies and profiles of the key figures in the industry as well. Further, it also contained updates on the science, the state of science and technology, uh, and sometimes downright bizarre experiments were a regular feature, such as this report of um, how, <laughs> how far uh, street, lights, <laughs> street lights and car lighting extends in Brisbane, for example. So I think a lot of it's quite miscellaneous, but together it amounts to something really interesting. The trade literature also provided reports on particular developments in the state and across the country, like this feature on the Richmond River, for example. As well, it provided news from around the world. The readers of this trade literature were encouraged then to imagine themselves as part of an up-to-date global community of like-minded electrical enthusiasts. And I think this literature, by this, by this time, as was fairly common uh, in the, the sales environment of the, the interwar period, it was animated by a particular vision of personal selling influenced by American industrial psychology that was becoming influential in Australia at this time. 
So the amount of material here is absolutely vast, and the, I encourage you to have a bit of an explore upstairs and see what kind of interesting stories you can find if we explore the social life of those whose lives were lived through the electrical trade. I'll skip over this example, but um, other sets of personal papers also give a personal perspective on the way that entire lives were lived in particular electrical industries, and, and that the rise of electrification did sort of shape entire lives, the entire course of lives and careers uh, in quite a, quite a deep and fascinating way. Finally then, I want us to think about some of the cultural transformations and changes in everyday life that were affected by electrical technology and infrastructure. Electricity was bound up in the everyday lives of Queenslanders in the years in question. And so how did they deal with electricity on an everyday basis? I think this encourages us to think much more closely about the way that domestic electricity usage grew over this period. So the, the use of electricity in the home took off from the 1920s. A 1923 survey found that around a third of all Australian houses, that's nationwide, were wired for electricity, and half of the homes in rural areas were in areas, sorry, half of the homes in Australia were in areas that were reticulated for electricity. That, that number was much lower for rural areas. By the 1947 census, about 20 years later, 80% of Australian homes were wired for electricity and almost all urban houses and just over half of rural properties at this time. And I think as well, this, this literature, as, this, as these examples from local uh, electrical manufacturers show, the rhetoric of domestic electricity was clearly gendered and rested on assumptions of everyday life that inscribed quite culturally predetermined roles to women. This is a common theme that we can see throughout this time. So I want to explore, I want to introduce you as well, just as I finish up, to explore um, one of the most fascinating examples, one of the most interesting finds that I've found that I've been thinking about time and again over the last year or so. It's a really interesting set of source material uh, that, again, is, is unique to the John Oxley Library collection. The Brisbane City Council Electrical Department in the interwar period produced a magazine called Electrical Topics in the mid to late 1930s as a way of both educating readers about the possibilities of electricity and of trying to stimulate greater consumer demand for the new energy source. The council published a total of 19 issues of this magazine between 1936 and 1938. Electrical Topics, which you can see upstairs as well in the, the White Gloves Experience, is a glossy modernist production and it's full of slick ads and snappy copy. It presents a vision of electricity as domesticated, as modern, as efficient and desirable, accessible to thrifty working class families as well as the elites. It was designed to stimulate consumer desires for the new technology, to bring electricity down from the street corners and the stage into the home, and to transform the routines of everyday life. It wanted to foster a civic sense of what the electrical industry then called electrical mindedness, to get people thinking about electricity in a really systematic, everyday, uh, quotidian sort of way. So why did the Brisbane City Council produce a glossy electrical magazine in the 1930s? The short answer is that it had a new product to sell. With the creation of the Brisbane City Council in 1925, out of the merger of 20 different municipal authorities, the council took over electrical supply for the greater Brisbane region. It gained the right and the obligation to supply electricity to the suburbs, while its competitor, the City Electrical Light Company, continued to supply power to much of the CBD area. The council also took over the tramways and built the new farm powerhouse in 1928. So a new municipal player had entered the electricity scene. The council oversaw rapid expansion in electricity usage in the Great Brisbane area, and in the depression years of the early 1930s, it offered a so-called assisted wiring scheme to encourage greater domestic energy consumption among working class families in particular. The electrical department's motto at this time was, every home a wired house. The department's annual reports, which I examined at the Brisbane City Council archives, report a growing interest by citizens in electrical stoves and hot water systems in particular. Now, the council electricity department was also involved in selling electrical equipment and appliances. This sounds extraordinary to us today, right? Imagine buying a kettle or a fridge or a fan from the council. But this was actually quite a widespread pr practice in the interwar period. Electrical authorities across the state went into retail selling as a way of stimulating demand for their wiring services. Persuading people to take up electricity was a key to ensuring ongoing demand. So in 1928, the council opened a trading department and a, and a showroom, and it sold appliances directly to the public. It employed eight sales staff and it pushed its electrical products aggressively. It put on regular public demonstrations of its appliances, which reportedly attracted large audiences. The largest was a mass cooking display that took place at the Woolloongabba Cricket Ground, at the Gabba, in 1929. And this public relations scheme continued throughout the 1930s. In 1934, Council opened a new showroom in the basement of Town Hall, where cooking demonstrations took place every second Wednesday. So electrical topics is a really interesting source that emerged at this exact moment. And as we can see, it kind of addressed itself explicitly at the women of 1930s Brisbane. Um, and it kind of 
idealised and promoted strong uptake of electrical, device, uh, of electrical devices and, and saw the home as a site of efficiency and scientific management and business in a strange way, tapping into this rhetoric of modern selling that was quite common in public discussions of consumption and domesticity at this time. So there are several extraordinary and kind of quite ambivalent uh, articles throughout. It's a really fascinating um, source of material, and I really recommend that you have a bit of a look for yourselves upstairs. Um, I think this, what we can see from this source is it encourages us to conceive of a community of women users of electricity in interwar Brisbane at a time in which many women experienced the novelty of a changing domestic setting and engaged actively and creatively with it. They went to cooking demonstrations, they experimented with new ways of living, and they tried out cool new recipes like prune mould. <laughs> Um, so I do encourage, and it's fascinating to see this is a magazine also full of advertising as well, kind of advertising the local businesses that sold electrical appliances. So I'll leave it there. This, there are so many fascinating examples, I think, that you can explore, and I encourage you to have a little look further in the White Gloves experience upstairs. What I've tried to do today is just offer a really brief glimpse into some of the enormous amount of materials that I've been exploring, some of the most... Um, um, I, I found so much, and I'm kind of getting my head around this massive collection I've had here. Just as I finish up, if you have any questions or, or concerns or anything you'd like to raise with me, please feel free to talk to me. I'd love to talk further about this. Any suggestions for new directions? Um, otherwise, just want to finish by saying another massive thank you to everyone here um, for coming today, for listening, and to the State Library for being such a generous supporter of my research over the last year. Thank you so much, everyone.